war and splitting of the society after the Russian Bolshevist revolution yes. uh, and the end uh, of the independent Ukrainian Rada Republic. This publication made uh, by leftist artists loyal to the Bolsheviks describes a utopia of a Soviet Ukrainian modernism. And on the stick is the first, uh, the first one, the first Oh, everything is there. is there. So you can see uh, the cover uh, offers a combination of vernacular decorativism with a so-called Narbut script. It's a script developed by, by the Ukrainian artist uh, Georgi Narbut, uh, Baroque characters, um, uh, and a strictly geometrical appearance. The combination of Latin and Cyrillic letters uh, was a novelty and had been invented by the editors. The colorful design with uh, juicy greens, bright reds and black, as well as movable letters that are playfully spread out from top to bottom, contrast with the seriousness of the task of the editors, they, they said themselves. Um, a uh, quite different uh, character has a second Oh, yes, well, everything works. Uh, uh, it has the second um, uh, image I present to you. It's the cable poem Across the Ocean by the leader of Panfuturist Mikhail Semenko. And it's printed in the opening of the issue and leaves a fully contrasting impression. This example of poetry painting in two colors, red and black, is directed to all. Uh, the graphic design has a uh, rigid, depersonalized, box-like uh, character. All continents and corners of the world are wired up in a circular manner. It's worth commenting uh, that uh, Mikhail Semenko worked as a telegraphist during the First uh, World War. The journal demonstrates the two faces of the Ukrainian modernism, folkloristic and homely, constructivist and transnational, no. okay. but it's also a demonstration of the geopolitical issues uh, is, as an artistic uh, message. Apart from um, typical no, yeah. futurist topoids, uh, such as oh. electricity, uh, aviation, telegraphy, transportation, machinery, the poem also contains abstract uh, concepts such as commune, uh, commune, uh, collective, or terror aligned in the form of a rebus. One axis of the network connects yeah, Moscow with different. Vladivostok, Honolulu, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York, as well as London, Paris, Berlin, uh -huh. Warsaw, and Kiev. This audiovisual uh, poetry painting, but it was supposed to be also an audio, uh, audio performance, um, suggested an almost apocalyptic vision of a complete transformation of the world. The deluvial masses were set in motions, oceans and mountains, subterranean strata and the cosmos, rivers, waterfalls, metropolises, as well as remote and exotic locations like the Niagara Falls, Alaska, the North, uh, and so were all drawn into the vortex of the world revolution. Most and Kiev are on the two opposite um, sides ends of the Kabul and communicate not directly but around the global uh, prophecy, maybe. Aside from the bold uh, typographic design, the poem also employed this new script used um, on the cover. The work depicts a non-hierarchical uh, view of the world order, centers without periphery. Visualized is also the connection between the artificial and the natural, uh, the social and uh, the artistic revolution. Uh, and with uh, this rigid and personal constructivism, the pan futurism aimed to demonstrate that they belong to the League of Global uh, Players. An attempt uh, of a transnational communication is demonstrated also in the manifesto of pan-futurism uh, scattered uh, across the brochure, printed in several languages, Ukrainian, Russian, German, uh, French, and English. 
to compare, there was a trend towards artists performing preoccupied with a geographical map uh, indicated in, uh, an attempt to transcend the peripheral status, assert uh, their own place on the artistic map. I show you the, uh, uh, the cover of the, the Polish, uh, Polish journal block and the advertisement uh, of the uh, Hungarian uh, journal uh, MA. I will add that uh, this project, this Ukrainian project, uh, demonstrates a longing for an integration of the Ukrainian or maybe of the East Central European modernism into a global network of the international avant-garde. It concerns uh, the creation of a new language, the artistic Esperanto, which allowed for a communication all over the ocean, connecting the avant-garde of the artistic and social uh, revolution. Its aggressive, self-confident uh, tune speaks about the self-perception on this map. In the last few uh, decades, uh, the art history has moved uh, um, uh, toward new theoretical settings shaped by the desire to become uh, more global and embrace other art traditions besides the so-called uh, Western Art Conference is one example of this. Uh, to the new approaches connected with the East or European art uh, belong, follow, firstly, the centering of the modernism with a special focusing on the former peripheries like Portugal on European modernism, but also well, the, the canonization is on the one hand, and the persistence of the card canon of the Western idiom is on the other. As Pater Mitter spoke of the embedded uh, hierarchy, or oh, the word I cannot, I cannot speak out, I'm sorry, <laughs> of the modernist canon in region regarded as a cultural periphery. Uh, secondly, uh, the search for hybridization, transcultural encounters, transnational history is Beate Hock demonstrated uh, us away from the entities. In, uh, in the contemporary art uh, in the post-communist country, the global context is obviously dominant, but my, by dealing with historical period is a, a tendency of reinterpreting, reconstructed uh, the national identity, uh, 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 the rewriting of their own uh, history of art. Um, Thirdly, the impact of the post-colonial studies uh, is remarkable not only on the literature and philosophy, but also on the uh, art history. And uh, uh, finally, ideas about redesigning the map of art history, about uh, revising its uh, geography are now quite in influential. Uh, as Thomas da Costa Kaufmann points out, notion of space and place are again becoming central in the uh, discipline, uh, also in new and exciting way. And I will touch these issues of geography while dealing with the Ukrainian um, modernism. A new geography of arts is, according to Piotr Piotrowski, a critical geography of, of art. The key uh, question would be to understand that if all references are not given by blood, soil, landscape, cl uh, uh, climate, etc., but are constructed by particular circumstances strongly determined by politics. Um, I want to remind, uh, to remember one art historian um, now forgotten, uh, Nikos Hadji Nikola, maybe some of, of, of the colleagues uh, remember uh, uh, him uh, still. And as early as uh, 1983, he demanded for a politicization of art history, call, uh, calling for a political geography of art. Uh, a method of looking at art was taking its political context into consideration. And he uh, issued warning on the problems of Eurocentrism, even Euro-Americocentrism, as well as Western uh, arrogance towards the backward periphery. And to this periphery uh, belonged uh, for him uh, such countries like Greece, Mexico, and Soviet Russia. Um, I. Uh, uh, so, the, the one of images we, we saw all, uh, already, uh, Tasha uh, uh, showed us uh, the, this cover of the exhibition on the left, uh, this uh, wonderful exhibition in Los Angeles, Munich uh, and Berlin. Um, uh, and uh, you see 
the, the geographical uh, perception. Um, uh, so its network of central European avant-garde is uh, drawn uh, and you, you see such centers uh, as uh, German centers such as Berlin, Odessa, or even Dusseldorf. Uh, uh, but uh, significantly, uh, it leaves out Paris and Moscow as an important point of orientation for the East Central European avant-garde. Uh, the map shows a network of center in Central and Central Europe which kept close contact with one another and offered creative impulses to the West. The entire Ukrainian avant-garde is missing from the map of avant-garde which accompanied the exhibition and the catalog. Uh, two days ago, uh, I visited an exhibition, uh, The Myth of Galicia, Galicia uh, in Krakow. And it's, it's a very interesting exhibition about colonization, about post-colonial condition, about the Austrians, uh, and a lot of, uh, about, about the Polish. Uh, uh, po Polish population, it's nothing about the Ukrainian. Nothing, really absent, absolutely. Um, uh, on the right, you see the new issued encyclopedia of the Russian avant garde. It is uh, an ambition, ambitious and ex very expensive enterprise. Uh, two uh, volumes of it are dealing with biography, uh, the other two forthcoming with artistic groups and exhibition. Uh, in opposition uh, to the previous work, uh, works uh, such as the history of the Russian avant-garde and the Krusanov, with its main idea of the centers and their margins, political centers as centers of art, and their radiation towards provincial cities, this publication points out its polycentric character. I quote, in the first uh, uh, third of the 20th century, the centers of the avant-garde were not only the capital cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg, but there was a, a fluctuation of centers like Vitebsk or Vilno, Vilno, um, not Vilnius, not Vilna, um, Odessa and Kharkiv, Tiflis and Baku. Uh, the geography of this book is not only the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, but also diaspora, Paris, Berlin and Prague. The other were coming, I quote, from Russia, the Ukraine, Belarus, Balticum, Europe, <laughs> Balticum, Europe, uh, and the USA. Uh, but uh, uh, the new shaping of the geographic frames and discovery of new names means the augmentation of the Russian avant-garde by the annexation of the national modernism. Uh, and they use uh, the, the term Ruski, not Rasiski. It's, it's a difference. Uh, uh, so Ruski, Russian national, Rasiski like, uh, like the geographic en entity. And so uh, on voluntary creation of a new imperial ideal of the Russian culture. As a part of the Russian avant-garde are conceived Ukrainian artists like Bogomazov, Ermilov, Boychuk, the Belarus Ulovis circle around Malevich, the Latvian artist Alexandra Belzova, Skulme family, Lithuanian Chorlonis, Georgian Lado Gudiashvili, Armenian Saryanis, etc. There is uh, also uh, uh, the name like main actors, uh, Malevich, Tatlin, Rayonov, Goncharova, Rochenka, Stepana, Popova, Exter, Melnikov, Ladovsky, Golosov, it's all, and the minor uh, artists, uh, uh, the rest. And the third, uh, the, the, the third uh, uh, so position is in the middle. Uh, I uh, show you the article published uh, some months ago by Felix uh, Philip Ingold, very, 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 very good, very interesting um, uh, Swiss uh, art historian who wrote a lot uh, about uh, about uh, the avant-garde, and it has uh, it has uh, the title. I don't know how to. To, uh, to translate the falling margins, maybe. Uh, the, the margins, they came there, uh, and he pretends that the Ukrainian avant-garde uh, was, uh, the Russian avant-garde was uh, Ukrainian. So, um, a sh short historical uh, overview. Ukrainian, uh, called Little Russia, was a part of the Russian Empire, and both culture, Russian and Ukrainian, enriched each other in many ways, uh, but under the premise of a Russian domination. Many Ukrainian artists, such as David Burluk, Alexander Ekstea, or Vasily Milov, belong to both cultural traditions. Burluk was trained in Moscow, Ekstea, and Kiev. The life trajectories were an adventure of changing places and countries. 
and typical bi biography of the avant-garde. The case of Malevich is very controversial and typical. How to define? According to, uh, to the excellent book of um, Andrzej Turovsky, uh, Malevich in Warsaw, he was a Russian artist born in Ukraine into a Polish family. According to the Ukrainian art historian Dmitry Horbachev, uh, himself born in Saratov, li like Belostotsky, um, he was a Ukrainian artist coming back home in the last years under the pressures of regime. He wrote and spoke Ukrainian and told the Kiev Art Institute. His Rus uh, Russian had a Ukrainian accent. Um, his es essays published in Ukrainian in Nova Generatia offer a sum of his theoretical and pedagogical works. His late works should be politically interpreted in the context of the Ukrainian Holodomor, aesthetically in the context of the Ukrainian modernism, and so on. So the division of both uh, cultures are strongly interwoven into each other is, as we can observe uh, it now in the political events, a very painful and dramatic procedure. procedures. Um, from the first uh, de decade of the 20th century, Ukraine became a vivid showplace of modernist visual art. Kiev was the first city in Russia with an electric tram. Uh, um, uh, in, in the Ukraine, uh, the sculptor Vladimir Izdebsky organized several salons, the first international exhibition um, for, uh, for German and Italian French, uh, French uh, artists. Um, uh, they, um, uh, in Chernyanka estate in the South Russia, this? Yes, um, uh, in the South Russia steppe region, home of the Burluk family, uh, became in the years following uh, 1910 the birthplace of the futurist uh, group Hileya. The Jewish culture organization Kulturliga endeavored uh, to form a Jewish secular uh, culture. Alexander Exter, I show uh, the build st st studio became uh, the educational center for artists and of uh, a radical, um, um, radical orientation. One of the most active and politically loyal artistic group of the 20s, uh, beginning of the beginning and beginning of the 30s was Pan Futurism. Uh, as they wrote in the manifest, what uh, does pan-futurism uh, uh, want? Pan-futurism, as they wrote, does not want to be utopia, but practice. For this purpose, it has constructed a pan-futurist system of coordinates, determining all practical contents of pan-futurism. Its formula as follows. Pan-futurism uh, is ideology plus fact, uh, factura, uh, it's like, uh, but it's not like texture, because factura is a material plus form plus contents. Uh, so constructivism wants uh, to be a construct, uh, panfuturism wants to be a constructive uh, system. But construction can not be accomplished only on the basis of, uh, or um, can be done uh, only on the basis of the accomplished destruction. The process of destruction of art is uh, the, uh, that of disorganization of the bourgeois uh, society. Um, and uh, they outlined the scientific theory, very, very, very interesting scientific theory of breaking art down into the smallest uh, components. Uh, and once this aim has been achieved, uh, the constructivist work can begin at the age of communism will arrive. How did it work in terms of the position on the global uh, map of modernism? Through communication, ex and alliance uh, strategies. Um, I skip yet uh, one part for the uh, for the. announced in the brochure never uh, came to fruition. Nonetheless, the pan-futurists uh, continued to have a life after 22. From 27 to 30, the group uh, published the journal Nova Generatia, the new generation in Kharkiv, uh, the journal of the left artistic uh, formation. 
the, the, uh, there are some examples of the Ukrainian uh, futurism between the urban, uh, uh, urban projects and the national folkloristic, uh, uh, folkloristic aesthetic. Uh, so this is the Nova generation that became the chief form of the Ukrainian modernism. It's also sought to play a mediating role between the West European Ukrainian avant-garde movements. It, it reported widely on the latest trends in West and Central Europe, especially in Central uh, Europe, uh, in Warsaw and Prague, and published articles on individual artists. Enrico uh, Heinrich, uh, uh, as they wrote, Prampolini was on the advisory board along with Herbert Wald and Laszlo Mohli, not uh, to name, but some of the foreign members of the editorial staff. Walden, who has been a prominent promoter of futurism since 12, had made an acquaintance, uh, the acquaintance of the editors on a tour to Kharkov and took it up on himself to distribute the journal in Western Europe from his base in Berlin. One of the plans of Nova Generatia was to write a documentary history of Ukrainian futurism and to integrate it into the general history of European avant-garde. Um, so is it possible to regard the self-proclaimed Ukrainian futurism as a part of the global European uh, futurist moment, or should it be compared uh, with other semi-para-futurist movements, Central, South, Eastern Europe, which emerged after the First uh, World War, developed markedly differently from the West European um, counterpart. Uh, the Ukrainian modernist artists and literati were well informed about the theories of the Italian futurism and used them for their own aesthetic uh, purposes. But they differed from uh, their colleagues in Berlin and Paris because of their market interest in theory and ideology. And another difference uh, can be seen in the use of vernacular folk uh, elements, uh, for example, of stitching uh, um, and other needlework as a method of the creation of abstract images in, in traditional fabrics and collage adaptation of Werther Christmas uh, shows uh, in, in, in theater installation. Um, the Soviet Union increasingly protected itself from the West even uh, through Soviet architects uh, continued to represent radical modernism in international exhibition and Western artists were permitted to visit Europe until the beginning of the 30s, even in the middle of the 30s. Uh, this uh, continued to happen in part even when other radical, radical direction in art were already being suppressed all over the country. By contrast, Polish and Lithuanian presence at international art exhibition was, uh, very tradi was traditionalistic and even folkloristic. They even gave rise to protests from artists uh, such as the group Bloch, supported by the Dutch and Czech colleagues regarding uh, the Polish participation at the exposition des Arts Décoratives in Paris in 25. Um, um, I come to the, to the end. Uh, all in all, new direction in Western art were, and still are, much better known uh, in East Central Europe than with uh, Versa. Uh, the Polish artist Leon Hvistik recognized the cause of the principal misunderstanding in the West's failure to accept Eastern European artists. French critics accused Polish art of the lack of exoticism, and it was perceived as colonial art without the magical uh, kick. The absence of an echo uh, in the West provoked various um, responses from artists in East Central Europe, from the special emphasis of the individuality of artistic development in Poland, linguistic or aggressive anti-Western attitude, barbarocentrism uh, uh, on the Balkan, Lubomir Micic. In this light, in the context of geographical and art historical discourse, the Ukrainian modernism still finds itself 
in the position that can best be described as in betweenness, uh, what uh, uh, Kasia uh, also described. Uh, thus, um, uh, the American uh, um, uh, American historian Stephen uh, de Zebetnik defined the situation concerning the culture of the post-war period in East, Eastern East Central Europe as in between peripheral and post-colonial uh, space. Has anything changed since then? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina. So, uh, next speakers are Maya and Ruben Fawkes. They are historians and curators whose interest is in the field of art and ecology. They create exhibitions, organize symposia, publish a lot. We all know them through their website and their organization Translocal, uh, which is based in Budapest. Um, most recently, they worked on the project concerning the rivers and uh, this is River School on the Danube, uh, on art and system, sustainability. They are also a uh, publisher on that in the uh, forthcoming editions of Art Margins Journal. Maya and Ruben will speak about towards a planetary history of East European art. Here you are. Okay. We want to thank uh, the organizers for uh, Galeria Labrador for this wonderful setting and for the organization and also to Piotr for this very nice gathering of East European scholars. We are very pleased to be here. Before we start with uh, de delineating a planetary perspective of East European art, we want to sketch out the position from which we are speaking and working, as it is increasingly clear to us that our formative years as curators and art historians were very much marked by the changes of 1989 and the years that, of uh, triumphal globalization that followed. As Croatian and British art historians who decided to settle in Hungary, one of the many so-called centers, uh, hearts of Europe, we believed in the abolition of East-West divide and the promise of trans locality. Made possible by revolutionized communication, both virtual through internet and physical, through the increased accessibility of air travel. When in the middle 2000s we were searching for appropriate domain name for our website, we came up with Translocal, not only because it described the potential of being situated in more than one locale, but also because of its affirmative reference to post-national cosmopolitan view of new Europe. However, as the Hungarian Prime Minister announced this summer, we are living in a different period now, with the onset of the financial crisis in 2008 marking the high tide of globalization and constituting an equally important turning point to the system change of 1989. A mile long counter-globalization stood as a potential alternative, more democratic and egalitarian model to globalization based on the values of neoliberal global capitalism. What we are witnessing today in Hungary is a kind of state-run counter-globalization um, directed towards national interests and a new notion that we have to come to terms with, that of illiberal democracy. But when Naomi Klein, in her precious book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, talks about the need to control capitalism, we do not think that she has the Hungarian model in mind. The Translocal Institute, which now has a physical form in Budapest, has to face the prospect of a potential forced translocality, a well-known phenomenon in the region, which was an aspect that we never envisioned. For us, translocality was the necessary comparative position from which to experience the particularities of the local situation while keeping in mind a planetary imperative. Uh, in 1989, the year we always go back to, Felix Gattari in his treasure tour essay, The Three Ecologies, already warned about the rise of all kinds of danger, racism, religious fanaticism, nationality schisms that suddenly flip into reactionary disclosure. Nevertheless, we still need to work towards what he calls the production of human existence in self that would be adaptable to a new historical context in which humanity finds itself. This new historical context has recently been recognized as the Anthropocene, 
based on the realization that the changes that are happening on the planet are no longer just a matter of geography, but actually cut into geological matter of the world. When scientist Paul Crutzen introduced the term in 2002 in his article in Nature to describe the escalating effects of humans on the global environment, he pointed to climate change, disappearance of rainforests, extinctions of species, the burning of fossil fuels, all major impacts to make humans an environmental force of geological proportions. But when he used the term, he could not foresee, foresee the success of it. Nowadays, geologists, scientists, theorists, as well as writers and artists are frequently engaging with it. Whether they situate the Anthropocene at the onset of industrialization in 18th or 19th century, or at the beginning of the Cold War with the threat of nuclear disaster, it is nevertheless clear that globalization has escalated the impact of humans have made on the planet to an unprecedented degree. So in the, in the face of an ever intensifying ecological crisis that challenges both the economic model and the ideology of globalization, the theoretical structures <coughs> of the global era are also beginning to show their flaws. Deepesh Chakrabarti, in his influential essay on the climate of history from, 19, from 2009, confessed as follows, as the ecological crisis gathered momentum in the last few years, I realized that all my readings in theories of globalization, Marxist analysis of capital, subaltern studies, and post-colonial criticism over the last 25 years, while enormously useful in studying globalization, had not really prepared me for making sense of this planetary conjuncture within which humanity finds itself today. Addressing this illusionary control of world processes that globalization implies, Gayatri Spivak made the important distinction between the global and the planetary, with the globe implying a disembodied virtual abstraction, which allows us to, quote, think about, think we can aim to control it, while the planet belongs to another system, which we inhabit on loan. And therefore, as Spivak suggests, we need to imagine ourselves as, quote, planetary subjects rather than global agents. The question that we would like to investigate here is what would constitute planetary history of East European art? Taking into consideration the fact that environmental humanities are the one of the fastest growing academic disciplines, what implication does this new paradigm have for the practice of art history? Uh, which to our best, uh, what could East European art contribute to the emerging field of planetary art history which to our best knowledge is still in the making in most regions of the globe. Looking more closely, how might this influence the established accounts of East European art history that have been habitually framed in relation to political history, leading to the neglect of art practices that fall outside the narrow scope of the political? And at the same time, bear in mind, as André Gortz expressed in the mid-70s, that ecology is also political, despite the fact that it was in the interest uh, of both the capitalist and socialist system tonight to deny its political potential. So the entwinement of ecological and political concerns is most clearly visible in the years leading up to 1989 and the fall of the Iron Curtain, through the complex relationship of art to environmental issues in the period. Although communist parties of the Eastern Bloc maintain that pollution is the problem of the capitalist West and cannot occur under socialism, the environmental flaws of real existing socialism would actually turn out to be fatal to the whole system. Significantly, the first UN summit on human environment held in Stockholm in 1972 was heavily coloured by the Cold War divide as the communist parties of Eastern Europe boycotted it over the ostensible reason of the representation of uh, East Germany. By not taking part, they effectively sabotaged the first attempt to take global action uh, in the face of mounting evidence of ecological crisis in the early 70s, leaving the West and the Third World embattled in, in discussions of unbridgeable social justice issues. At the same time, boycotting the conference was a handy way to sweep under the carpet and restrict public discussion of the corrosive environmental problems in their respective countries across the bloc for another decade. But by the 1980s, the scale of environmental pollution accumulated by state socialism had reached a level that could no longer be covered up, and the secret reports about the condition of the environment started to leak into the public sphere, 
turning into international affairs and triggering, triggering mass protests. The consequences of industrial pollution in the black triangle between Czechoslovakia, Poland and East Germany blew over the Cold War divide. Chemical pollution from Romanian factories led to protests in Bulgarian town of Rusa on the other side of the Danube, while the same river was the centre of concern for the environmental movement in Hungary with massive gatherings to oppose the plans for hydroelectric dam between Hungary and Czechoslovakia. The Chernobyl disaster on 26 April, uh, April 1986, uh, a nuclear meltdown that released clouds of radiation across the continent, was the final blow to the environmental record of socialist bloc. As a consequence, Green Party, parties featured regularly on the ballots of first free and democratic elections across Eastern Europe during the political changes of 1989. So the planetary aspects of East European art can be uncovered in a, in, in a host of artistic, curatorial and art historical positions towards the ecological crisis of late socialism. Although these did not constitute a coherent movement and were rich in contradictions and dissonances, for instance, the Maribor Gallery in Slovenia organized a Yugoslav Triennial of Art and Ecology that started in 1980. However, in line with the official Yugoslav take on ecology uh, as an apolitical domain, the work selected often stayed on the level of the representation of nature, prompting curator Igor Zabel to comment in his 1988 catalogue text on the lack of socially engaged approaches at the time. On the other hand, artists were also involved in uh, artistic protests, environmental protests, such as the actions to highlight pollution in Bulgaria uh, by wearing gas masks and also wrapping trees in plastic, which when you see the image today seems like an incredibly 80s thing to do. Um, particularly illustrative of potential of artistic engagements with the environment at the time were also the actions undertaken by Lona Nemet and Josef Juhas in protest against the building of hydroelectric dam between Slovakia and Hungary. Josef Juhas described his performance, Duna Saurus, as follows. <coughs> One of the side arms of Danube was completely cut off from the river. I came out of the Oxbow in full diving suit with the living fish in plastic bag. On the bank, I told the fish's request to the people that it wants to connect to its peers. We went with those pres present to tell the police officer guarding the entrance to the, f the fish's request. The police heard us, but did not let the fish into the construction site. Therefore, I released the fish back to the Oxbow. In this work, you has not only drew attention to the absence of democratic discussion about the dam project, but also spoke for the fish species and about human responsibility for their fate. Ilona Nemet's guerrilla public intervention involved drawing the silhouettes of local tree species on the sides of the dam during its construction phase. These were destined to be wiped out as the dam was filled with water, while her ephemeral action pointed to the inevitable drastic effects of the dam on the river Rhine environment. Going beyond the immediate concerns of the protesters with the effect of the dam on a particular cherished national landscape or ecosystem, their artistic interventions also posed, po pointed to wider problems around techni technocratic interference with, with river processes. Attitudes to environmental art at this crucial juncture also revealed by the critical reception of the environmentally conceived traveling exhibition resource course held in Muchanok, Budapest in 1990. As critic Juliana P. Such used to review in the uh, daily in Neb Sabacak to reveal how a long-standing illusionary deep faith in the human, as she said it, had been dispelled by new awareness of environmental questions. She explained the break from modernist humanism and the shift from viewing Boyce's honey pump as a capitalist stupidity and Smith's viral jetty as a well-advertised bluff in the light of sequences of environmental events. As she said, then came Push Najmaroš Dam. Then we saw the denuded fir trees of the North Czech, Czech lands. Then we experienced the West Berlin smog alert caused by Trabans. Then Chernobyl expo exploded. Then the 8 a.m. news started to read out pollution levels. Then we started to see art with different eyes. Our historian Kathleen Kescher's review in Uweset of the same exhibition entitled Revolutionary Decadence or the Color of Tomato Soup 
revealed her critical attitude to the works in the show, in which she identified a lack of revolutionary vigour and activism, making a, an oblique reference to the well-known culinary metaphor for the softer, less ideological Guyash communism of the Kada era and the unrevolutionary unre nature of the negotiated system change of 1989 in Hungary. In her writing, it is clear that even environmental art fails to materialise into more solid, engaged, activist responses to acute environmental problems. This understanding turned out to be true more globally in terms of the squandering of another precious opportunity to articulate a global response to mountain ecological crisis at that time. Although the ending of the Cold War made possible the second attempt to respond to ecological ch challenges on the global level at the Rio summit uh, in 1992, in the end, despite a lot of environmental rhetoric, the achievements were modest, as the desire to combat climate change came up against the economic imperatives of globalization through the infamous coinage of sustainable development. Subsequently, while in East Europe, during the roller coaster of transition, environmental concerns were supposed superseded by the consumerist promises of capitalism. In the Old West, the radical notion of sustainability was hijacked for a new drum of economic growth under the banner of green capitalism and carbon trading. However, as Andre Gortz in his Ecology as Politics asserted, growth oriented capitalism is dead. Growth oriented socialism, which closely resembles it, reflects the distorted image of our past, not of our future. Expressing his critique, critique of industrial society in both its socialist and its capitalist guises. The idea that communist goals were to be achieved through growth, in fact, lay at the heart of the project of building socialism, epitomized by the five-year plans of the Stalin era. The model of development devised in the Soviet Union in the 1930s and exported to Eastern Europe after the Second World War. The short-sightedness of this model, the Gortz identified with its blindness to ecological limits and ideological fixation on the future, was also manifest in the official art of the time. And one of the main genres of socialist realist art was the portrait of the leader, depicted surrounded by the adorning masses in conversations with comrades or at the center of historical events. In the years after the World War II, the great leader came to be portrayed as a more solitary figure as in the case of Pedro Shurpin's iconic The Morning of Our Native Land, against the backdrop of the Soviet countryside. The artist described his ideologically fueled <coughs> vision for the creation of these works as follows. In the sound of the tractors, the movement of trains, in the fresh breeding of the limitless spring fields, in everything I saw and felt, the image of the leader of the people. Indeed, glancing at this painting, one, one can hear the sound of unstoppable progress embedded in the five-year plan of Soviet modernization, feel what was assumed to be the unlimited bounty of Soviet nature, and observe the larger-than-life figure of Stalin with his hands clasped in front of him suggested satisfaction and job well done. So interestingly, the painting was made in the year that also symbolized the dawn of a unique experiment in the environmental history of the Soviet Union. The resolution adopted unanimously by the Communist Party on the 20th of October 1948, which, which became known as the Great Stalin Plan for the Transformation of Nature, envisaged the geoengineering of the whole natural system of the Soviet Union. The plan had three basic elements the sculpting of rivers by turning them into a service for industry, agriculture and cities, the planting of massive forest belts to protect farmlands from droughts and hot dry winds, and the building of an extensive network of roads, railways and dams. Even landscape painting could be a tricky genre for artists under Stalinism, as for instance they had to clear the use of rain in positive, always sunny and future oriented socialist realist art. One proposed solution was to focus on the beautiful rain that brings harvest, since even a landscape with rain may exist if it's a beneficial rain. When Alexei Gritsai painted A Stormy Day in Zhiguli in 1950, which shows a barge fighting its way up, to the, up the Volga through stormy weather, one critic observed that in courageous struggle with the stormy elements, a laden self-propelled barge uh, of a kind that has become a typical feature of the river landscape during the, la the, during the Stalinist five-year plan continues confidently on its way. 
The barge has been typically interpreted as a metaphor for the ship of state, but could it also symbolize the Stalinist attitude to nature? The ship's mastery of the waves reflects an ideology that saw nature not just as unlimited resource for exploitation, but as practically an enemy of state at the very moment uh, that environmental history reveals the river was in the process of being ruthlessly uh, tamed and defeated. And while the socialist system shared the capitalist fixation with growth, the scale of environmental degradation, particularly in the Soviet Union, exceeded that in the Western branch of industrial society. Environmental historians have concluded that the Soviet worldview and practices towards the natural environment went beyond those common to Enlightenment thinking about the desirability of reshaping nature to serve human needs, the inevitability of progress, and the ability of humans to subjugate nature. It was against the background of that that East European artists began in the 1960s and early 70s to voice an opposing ecological attitude to the planet, which goes hand in hand with the articulation of environmental crisis on a planetary scale. One such articulation of planetary approach to the environment came from Slovak artist Rudolf Sikora, who developed an exemplary ecological critique despite the obstacles he faced in normalization era Czechoslovakia. In a situation where even environmental scientists could not get access to latest scientific findings and environmental debates of the time, the artist managed to get hold of a Samstad copy of the study produced for the Club of Rome, which was the subject of weekly discussions in his studio, and through him, limits to growth entered Slovak art history. As a young artist with an interest in cartography, Sikora was represent representing the places he visited as abstract geographies. However, However, as normalization took hold and the socialist border stiffened to the degree that Bratislava fell closer to Moscow than to Vienna, the artist started to think about environmental issues that spanned the globe and could not be contained within any state borders. This is evident in his work, The Earth Must Not Become a Dead Planet, from 72, conceived as a series of graphic sheets. Here, Sikora inscribed the layers of the Earth's atmosphere, as well as the geological layers of the planet's crust on each sheet, with a central image charting the presence of human civilization, expressed through architectural structures from Stonehenge to modern housing estates. The last sheet shows a nuclear mushroom cloud, clearly warning that the Earth should not become a dead planet. Although on this chart, global warming is not visible in the layers of the atmosphere and the effects of extraction are not yet inscribed in the layers of the Earth's crust, this early 70s work correctly predicts the danger towards, human, towards which human civilization is heading. What Sikora expressed in his work and what Andre Gortz voiced in his writings is that until very recently, all economics, whether economists, whether uh, classical or Marxists, have rejected as irrelevant or reactionary even all questions concerning the longer term future, that of, that of the planet, that of the biosphere or that of civilizations. This is, uh, insight is as relevant now as it was in 1970s, <coughs> a decade when environmental crisis was for the first time perceived on a planetary scale. Forty years later, and with half of the Earth species lost on the way, we are still largely failing to get the message with putting abolishing the Ministry of Envi Environmental Protection, with bright future for the new nuclear plants despite Fukushima, and little hope of holding global warming uh, at the already weak official target of two degrees above pre-industrial levels. On the other hand, a glimmer of hope could be seen in the new Ecuadorian constitution from 2008, with grants, uh, which grants nature where life is reproduced and exists the right to exist, persist, maintain and regenerate its vital cycle. In that light, we want to conclude with the recent work by Hungarian duo Tomasz Kosas and Oniko Laurent, entitled Pangea, Visual Aid for Historical Consciousness. This complex installation places human civilization and the social struggles that have accompanied it within a longer geological time frame by referring to the period more than 200 million years ago when all the continents formed one landmass surrounded by a single ocean. Pangaea speaks about the unity and interdependence of all Earth, both, to, both historically and from today's globalised perspective. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh,
it for your talk. We still have a good hour for the final discussion. Uh, I think you showed us um, three different dimensions of uh, globalization um, in the context of Central Eastern Europe. I mean, the first paper of Marina. Um, I think it hinted at the par paradox that uh, in order to, to become global, you first have to have a well-defined identity, and uh, paradoxically, you can arrive there at uh, sort of reviving the issue of national identity. And so that would be my, my, my question to you. What extent these two cases, in, especially in the countries like Ukraine, you know, depend on each other? Can you get global before you define yourself? And if you want to define yourself, you have to some of us detach yourself from globalization. So that's kind of a paradox because as I understand Ukrainian avant-garde is looking for his identity first as Ukrainian, that to become global. Um, for the second uh, speakers, uh, Maya and Ruben, I think this is one of the very obvious examples that there are things that are really global and we don't have to invent them. I mean, we're creating a region maybe, but we, the ecology is really the problem of, of, the, of the global world. So, so in this respect, uh, this is something that really unites us. But my question would be, what about the politics of the ecological movement? Um, was, it, was it equally sort of universal in the sense that it, as far as I, as far as I remember the Polish case, um, the politics of the artists were very different. They were not only sort of left liberal, there were also people who spoke, for instance, from the um, purely religious perspective or spiritual perspective. So that's kind of interesting, I think, question to me. To what extent uh, ecology is also so universal because everyone can subscribe to it. There's not like that you fix politically. Um, and uh, for Clara, if I must, may ask, this was an amazing evidence of how the global really works. Um, and this archival research is always fascinating. Um, my question to you is not a very elegant one, but what about money? Was there a kind of financial interest? Uh, and to what extent these visitors were also welcome because it meant that the artists had access to a, a different money, basically. So if I, this will be my questions. Uh, are there any questions from the public? Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your very interesting uh, paper and uh, it was a pleasure for me because I think that your interests are very, very close to, to mine and um, um, maybe firstly I, I, will, I will speak about Glusberg because I think it's important also to say that Glusberg was an artist and he considered himself as, as an artist, oh it's like the first. And uh, then after um, Glusberg and uh, also uh, Kishel Mudeisel, but also Walter Zanini was the, the third uh, key person that supported the spreading of uh, Eastern European art in Latin America. And it is also interesting to, um, to, to, to think about that uh, for Glusberg, it was not very easy to, um, uh, to, to get in touch with uh, with the Polish uh, artistic milieu. Um, for example, um, uh, Andrzej Turowski, you know, Professor Andrzej Turowski, uh, um, uh, told that uh, the Foxhall Gallery uh, um, didn't want to, to collaborate with Glossberg because he's, uh, he supported, uh, he argued that, uh, that uh, Glossberg supported very, very, um, uh, very good and very ba bad art. And, uh, and he was not selective enough to, look, to collaborate with him. Uh, and, uh, and that's why also Bluesberg contact, uh, um, um, were in touch with, uh, with the Wrocław artistic media, for example. And also from, uh, from the Warsaw media, but uh, um, outside of the Fox Academy, as for example, Bogutski, Janusz Bogutski. And, uh, 
And the, uh, the other thing is also that uh, Greensburg was really, I think, more successful as um, uh, as the critic of uh, a theoretician of architecture in Poland, because uh, in the 80s, because for example, uh, in 1982, uh, he was a key uh, keynote speaker uh, at the uh, Terra, uh, Terra 2 conference in Wrocław, organized by, uh, by, uh, by, by Stefan Miller. Um, and uh, the, the other, no, it's just some remarks because as I'm living in Argentina, it's for me it's like easier to, to have some information. And, uh, and I think it's also important to, uh, to think about it. I, I can also say that maybe in France it was even worse than, in, than with Fox because uh, uh, Jean Hubert Martin, no, uh, the French, uh, um, the French uh, creator, uh, told that the French uh, French milieu uh, was also like distance to close back uh, because uh, he was a, like a rich man and and, and uh, from and came from a very poor and uh, politically unstable uh, region and uh, and he told to me that they primarily they thought that uh, he was from CIA. And, um, and, and another is a question, because uh, I would like to, uh, to, to know more about your perception of uh, male art contacts, which are very important between, uh, between Eastern Europe and Latin America, um, because uh, I think it's very difficult to, uh, um, to judge you know, today those, uh, those contacts, and uh, not only for for art historians, but, but also for, for the actors. Uh, uh, recently, um, I spoke with uh, with, uh, with Clementa Parin that you mentioned also, and uh, and he told that for him, um, uh, he, he, sp he, he spoke about the thetic function, no? which, uh, which according to, um, to Jakobson, no? like the classical uh, theory of communication, um, it's an act uh, which precedes the communication. Um, so, uh, uh, and he also he, he told that for him, like for, uh, email and contacts was was a kind of uh, a kind of um, statement that I am here. No? no, it's just a question because uh, it will be very interesting uh, for me to 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 tell you your opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. The conference is getting better and better. I have a question from, from uh, for uh, Maya and Roy. Uh, your project, it's fantastic. But I didn't understand one thing. Uh, your uh, research, is it based on the statement of the artist vis-a-vis -vis ecology, or the way you, as researchers, curator, art historian, read certain works? I mean, I have in mind, for instance, Oho Group or Shempas, colon, uh, Group Shempas. Do they fit to this narrative of yours or not? Just a question. Kasia, Kasia Morawska. Okay, I, so I just also wanted to congratulate all the presenters for their fantastic uh, papers, very interesting. And perhaps I will uh, just add uh, a little comment to uh, Maya and Ruben's paper. Thank you very much for that. I just uh, wanted to say that uh, when uh, in Norwich uh, there is a Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts, and there was during the Polish the, during the Polish year, Polska year in, in in England, there was a an exhibition of Polish contemporary art, and the curators from the gallery went to Poland in, in order to find artists. And the, the question that was posed by the by the major curator Amanda Daly was that there are no artists for whom environment matters. You know, so she was actually surprised um, because she was looking for something that would, that would, um, that would appeal also to the, um, to the. I mean, of course, she was wrong in a way because of, 
there are artists. Well, well, we do know Tchaikovsky, etc., etc. But still, I think that um, that simply your emphasis on the issue of environment is is very much needed, and 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 you know <laughs> things should be published as a kind of record of book which would which would which would uh, which would help others. Then uh, to Marina, um, I would uh, I also would like I, I would like to ask you about the state of scholarship. On, uh, on Ukrainian, uh, um, uh, you know, avant-garde. Um, I mean, just, 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 just tell us something, something more about that. Who actually? I, I mean, I, I'm myself very interested. I know just a few people who who wrote texts about it, but I, I would like to find out from you more about that. And eventually, a kind of, a, and one more question to um, to Clara. It's was it, I mean, because you work in the archives, so you have the kind of first, you know, I mean, the best view of, of the situation. Is it really a male word? Are there any significant others among those mm, women, I mean, the agents um, who operated, um, who actually, who, mm, who stimulated the mm, working of those networks? Thank you for all three uh, highly interesting uh, uh, papers and each course full of original research. So I would also like to ask a question uh, to Marina about the Ukrainian avant-garde because it is true that it has come to the fore in the last few years. Somehow for a very long time uh, there was nothing uh, that was internationally known about it. And um, I wonder why you think this was the case and uh, how connected to Ukrainian avant-garde in the 1920s, 30s, from which uh, period you showed examples, was to the international avant-garde. So that maybe is something that you, you may want to say something more about. This is a question to Maya and Jogan. Uh, this is a very fresh then, uh, scholarship, and I so much appreciate you know, to open a sort of mind, you know, to the different, completely different uh, fields that we used to work uh, on uh, up to now. It's of course, uh, it deals with what's going on right now in the humanities. And, um, you know, the question of anthropos Anthropocene, you know, the question of I, I, uh, environmental stu uh, studies, the question of uh, post-humanities, uh, post-human condition, and so on and so on. But dealing with this vocabulary with uh, central or eastern central, doesn't matter how we call this, uh, art, you know, it's really, uh, it's really a sort of opening, completely different and fresh perspective. But I like, old prospect, but I'd like to ask you whether you see a sort of possibility for retrospective studies. Uh, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, global art history is, is somehow deals with globalization, and this is this is the reason we, uh, we are here saying or talking about uh, global uh, or um, central or East European art from the global uh, global perspective. Do you see such a possibility, uh, such a such a such a possibility to con conduct deep historical studies? Not from the global perspective, but from the uh, planetary science, using completely different vocabulary as the planet is. Planet versus uh, the global. Do you see such a poss uh, possibility to go retrospectively to see much deeper art history than uh, the question of uh, 60s or uh, 70s? Thank you. Thanks for the question, sir. Perhaps you could answer, you start with Marina, and then Urban, and Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Andre, for, for, for the first uh, question, looking uh, for identity to, uh, to become uh, global. Uh, it's, it's really the crucial uh, question, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, they, they uh, developed a, a real strategy uh, for it, how to become uh, global, uh, in creation, by creation, uh, 
the identity. And the first uh, step is uh, the, the door that uh, so did uh, also the, the Polish uh, modernists uh, in the beginning of the 20s uh, uh, to destroy, uh, to, to, to keep uh, Mitskevich from the, uh, yes, uh, so, so the, the, the usual things uh, um, uh, away from the, from the apartment. The pedestal, <laughs> the base where, where the statue uh, uh, says. And uh, su such iconic figure for, for the Ukrainian was Taras Shevchenko. Uh, and it, it, it was a struggle with, with, with the role, with the importance of uh, Taras Shevchenko, because the Ukrainian uh, culture uh, was uh, partly reduced <coughs> to, to, to Taras Shevchenko. Taras Shevchenko was, was there for. Maybe not all of them now is uh, um, uh, he, he was um, he was a serf uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was trained uh, in, uh, by benevolence of of, of his owner uh, as an artist in St. Petersburg in the Academy of, of Arts and uh, became freedom was a writer was a, was a painter. Uh, was uh, sent to Caucasus and uh, and died there. So the, the uh, tragic, uh, tragic uh, um, uh, very 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 good, uh, very good uh, writer uh, and so on. But but the central figure and they tried to develop another identity, uh, not not this reducing to to to, to one person. Uh, and to, um, to develop uh, at first a new language, I, I showed uh, also uh, graphically how, how uh, it worked, but also the, the language of, uh, of the art, and uh, to develop a new uh, canon, uh, the canon of modernism and traditionalism. It was always this between. Um, uh, uh, so, and uh, the um, question of uh, uh, um, uh, geography wa was very important because uh, they tried uh, to uh, to find uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, their friends, and uh, it, it was Dada. Uh, uh, so it was Paris and Berlin. It was uh, it were Dada artists, but they were. Um, uh, isolated, quite quite isolated from uh, the rest of the world. The, the question to, uh, of uh, Eva, um, uh, they uh, knew uh, a little bit uh, about the events in in Warsaw and in in Prague in Eastern uh, Central Europe and tried to connect uh, relationships with uh, uh, with, uh, with the artists uh, and uh, uh, but also. Through this network of the journals, it was very important. The, the journals and the dissemination of the, the journals uh, contact uh, the uh, transnational, um, uh, the international avant uh, The state of scholarship, um, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, uh, publications of, uh, of the um, uh, American, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian uh, born. Uh, 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 art historian uh, uh, and historian of the literature, like Imitsky, like, uh, Miroslav Mudra, uh, uh, very, very, very uh, pioneering publication of Miroslav Mudra uh, uh, about Nova, uh, Nova Generatia. And uh, in, in, in the last years, um, a lot of publication in, in Ukrainian itself about, about the Aspara, uh, about the Ukrainian uh, the Aspara in Paris, uh, called the uh, the, the Paris, uh, but uh, but it's uh, for uh, for me it's all, always also the uh, try to, of seeking for, for for the national. And my my conception of it is uh, that uh, that this identity is is Ukrainian and Russian uh, at the at the, sa at the same time. And also the mixture of, of the languages. Uh, some of, of the painters of the writers use Russian. Some uh, some. Uh, Ukrainian, and this identity uh, should be uh, so. This this complex uh, identity, transnational uh, identity. So, uh, was this anything uh, also? Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.
It, it does, it does. Perhaps uh, I can give my lines of answers to the questions that we see and then maybe you can uh, as well, uh, answer them. Uh, the one thing about thinking about the environment and understanding the qualities of ecology is to understand that all the complexities that ecology as such uh, implies and, uh, and to think about it in political terms is very much to be aware that uh, ecology was through history and when it was invented in the middle of the uh, 19th century, this uh, historic period um, uh, of the mid of the century, invented, it was already either ignored or used in different ways and through the history, both from the left and from the right, we know it, it was invented in 1851 by uh, uh, Charles Heckel, biologist who defined it, and at the same time Marx completely ignored all the questions at the same time in the capital, same period. And we can follow how the, how the concept of ecology uh, uh, developed through the, our recent history and how it was used in the Third Reich and what was, how it was uh, ignored or used uh, during the social spirit as well and uh, what was tolerated, what was allowed and what was not allowed uh, in terms of environmental movements, uh, nature protection, mild, uh, going into nature was allowed and tolerated, but anything serious was not allowed. And through the period, we have to be aware of this both uh, left and right um, appropriations of uh, eco ecology and, uh, and all the criticism that it receives. And uh, this is also the reason why it's, uh, this is also the reason why it's so hard to deal with environment art because we have to be aware that it was used on all sides and in all ways. Sometimes more activists, sometimes. It was criticized for lack of acti activism. And to think about, uh, to answer the boy is uh, is an uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, today we wanted to give an overview of what could constitute uh, East European history from the 50s um, to, uh, to now. Uh, and that's why it was very short and sketched. Uh, my book is coming out, and in there uh, I have a whole chapter on the on the Oho group and Schenkel's family. What is interesting about them is that uh, they were a priori, on the one hand, a priori ecological, on the other hand, it was completely neglected in the art, historic, art, art history sources about them. So when I look at them, I do, I'm very much aware of the both. Uh, to correct what was, or what is my or interpreted in terms of ecology from a critical point of view, and at the same time understand uh, their ecological involvement or uh, sensitivity to the environment. And I do look uh, at other comparative cases from the Eastern Europe around 1970 or post-68, this very specific moment. But the thing about art history, whether it's just interpretations, it's better on artistic examples or not, it's a question, it's a kind of a double sword. We have to think about the artists which, uh, as uh, Kasha said, there are no East European environmental artists, so people find, fail to recognize them. And that way we need to bring the interpretation forward. Even if it exists in the works and read the works of what is, is the interpretation is necessary to analyze these works in terms of environment. But on the other hand, we do need to contextualize them in the art historical or in the in more in the as well as environmental historical moments of the time that were created in. And this leads me to the question of uh, Piotr, and obviously, we do need, obviously, yes, yes, we do need this long reading, and it could, it could stretch to mid-19th century for sure, but it could go much further. And I would like to paraphrase Timothy Morton, who said, that just when, as we are used to look at the uh, paintings or art from the point of view of gender or race, we should be, we should be asking ourselves, what does this art say? about the environment, even if no trees appear on it. And uh, ju just, just to add a few, a few more uh, remarks, I think most of the questions uh, answered, maybe starting the other way around with the, uh, uh, with the Piotr's uh, comments and uh, questions. Maybe also just, just to mention that uh, you know, we're trying to uh, put together uh, this kind of new, new way of, of looking at uh, East European uh, art history uh, in terms of uh, ideas like the Anthropocene and, um, and uh, environmental art history. We'll have, 
Well, and putting it within the global perspective, creating a new global narrative, will have to go hand in hand with that, with the general uh, uh, research into those fields for different regions, for different areas. So it's, it's, it's uh, new for uh, Eastern Europe, it's also pretty new for other regions as well. But uh, I mean, it was interesting that uh, uh, you know, for us at the, um, at the Association of uh, Art Historians in, in the UK earlier uh, uh, this year, there was actually a panel on uh, not ecology and art, but ecology and art history, which we, which we also spoke on, which we, we think is also a, a, an interesting sign that there is a kind of a general move towards asking these questions about uh, you know, what would an environmental <coughs> art history be. Uh, not just for Eastern Europe, but for other regions as well. And these, maybe these narratives will uh, uh, come together and uh, uh, make more sense in a kind of planetary way when, when we have different parts of the picture from uh, 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 different areas in the globe um, as well. Um, uh, also, also, just on, on, uh, on the, the question of uh, uh, po uh, the politics of, of, uh, of uh, art and art and ecology in Eastern Europe, I mean, definitely, there is always this tendency of, uh, of, of, uh, you know, of ecology being used by uh, uh, I don't know, progressive forces and, and more uh, uh, reactionary forces, if you like, and uh, you know, just in terms of nationalism, obviously, ecology has been used a lot uh, uh, and found its role in, in, uh, in uh, national movements. But it's also true at, at these different stages. So even in the in the 80s think about the dam protests, they can also, you know, on the one hand, they were environmental protests against the, the building of the dam between Hungary and Slovakia, on the other hand, they sometimes took a more uh, national uh, uh, kind of turn in, in terms of you know, the people wanting to protect their own national uh, landscape, their beautiful national landscape from, from ruination from the, from, from the dam. But what we were interested in Taking these examples we chose of Jozef uh, Juhas uh, and Ilona Nehmet is that their work seemed to go beyond a little bit this, this national um, preoccupation and point to more planetary uh, dimensions of the problem. So the relationship to species in the river and to, and to the whole history of the, uh, of the river um, uh, as well. I mean, just one, one more example, just to you think of uh, 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 environmental protests uh, recently in or, in uh, Romania over the um, uh, uh, the Rossi Montana uh, gold mining project. And, also, and there's also been a lot of artistic involvement in, 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 in those uh, uh, protests. Uh, but when, you, when you talk to people involved in those movements and the, and the artists involved in it, they're very much aware of the, of the, of the risk that that kind of uh, uh, protest just becomes a, a protest we must protect uh, you know, Romanian Hills against uh, you know, multinational uh, mining corporation and others who, who uh, are aware that we have to keep a, uh, a wider global perspective and see the interconnection between what happens in, in one area of the globe and, and uh, uh, environmental problems uh, elsewhere. Thank you, Clara, please. Um, I think that uh, yeah, my paper is kind of trivial compared to some of these issues, but. Um, women, um, there, there are some uh, important women, um, and I did mention them, um, Graciela Gutierrez Marx, um, who um, was a really important networker um, from uh, La Plata and um, is associated with the Gran Antonio Vigo, um, Dora Maurer, um, um, uh, Helena Kontova, uh, Maria Slavetska. So, there are. Um, I still I, I would be hard pushed to say that they and their personalities come through with the same force historically um, in the archives or in the interviews that I have done with people. I think uh, this isn't to say that they weren't um, extremely active, and, but often in a perhaps quieter, less bombastic way. Um, and I think you're very right that I have to be careful that in my own writing um, I don't allow those personalities and those sorts of performative issues to um, cloud my selection. Um, so thank you for that. The question from Andre about money is, is interesting and I did um, try to highlight um, at several points in my paper this question of money and 
I didn't have time to do the uh, conclusion, although I did end kind of on this financial note, talking about uh, perhaps, well, uh, polities, um, a financialization, if you like, of, um, of the through art diary, which yes provided a service, but also made money from this service for arguably the first time. Um, the question about money, um, I, I really rather liked um, Pernetsky's um, kind of analysis of how difficult it is uh, the the relationship between. Uh, poverty and the print run of, uh, of issues and I mean the most famous example is the Fluxus artist you know trying to actually sell Fluxus works and turn it into a business and failing miserably they were just caught in the gap perhaps time-wise um, and I think that um, that question of sort of trying to um, not just not to make money but to make something sustainable financially um, was a problem and this is of course something that we do have to bear in mind when we look in the archives and there are certain uh, things, that's why the example of Grossberg's uh, Kaik newsletter is so interesting because it's everywhere and, and, and we know that that is because he could afford for it to be everywhere. But there are other examples of people like um, uh, Jürgen Schweinenbraden whose uh, work is really in a lot of archives and I don't know about his money situation. So. I, these are kind of you know personal questions, but they do. And if we're going to make a material historical analysis, I think it is important. But as Pernetsky said, it's really the best kept secret. Um, how did people pay for these things? And so, to what extent I will be successful in uncovering uh, these matters is interesting. And um, thank you very much for all your interesting comments about. Um, uh, the Latin American uh, scene, Argentina in particular. Of course I am aware of um, uh, Zanini and I've been to the archive and uh, Cristina Ferreira has done lots of work on Zanini in particular and I have um, found some you know, wonderful material in, um, in the archives of, uh, of the museum there um, and also in relation to the Sao Paulo uh, Biennial and the mail art sections and so on but I mean uh, it's not possible to say everything in one paper. Um, uh, so you are a Gluesberg sympathizer, so you know more than I do about Gluesberg um, because you have met him and uh, I tried to meet him and... Sorry? Yes, okay, well, no, no, I know, but, uh, this, uh, but in terms of a younger scholar actually succeeding in doing an interview with him, this is a no mean feat and I've met, I know at least five other people who have tried to, well, perhaps we can talk about this later, but um, the, the thing that I didn't talk about, um, and you said, oh, it was difficult for Norsberg, et etc., et cetera, but actually it wasn't very difficult because he had an institutional backing and a position um, in the form of the presidency of AICA, and as did Restani, and AICA is a chapter of the book that I'm writing on networking the block, and obviously AICA provided a fantastic and, and crucial framework for these exchanges um, and, uh, and uh, you know, one pathway, and um, it's impossible to, and I actually, um, I was speaking to a former director of the Pompidou, um, who was telling me about his early collaborations on the Présence Polonaise um, with um, uh, Stanislav, Stanislavski, and, um, and, and so we're talking about this whole kind of generation of, of curators and Jean-Hubert Martin and so on, and they were really acting in this, so, such an interesting way on the borderline, on the, on the borders between uh, a kind of an official uh, network, an international network of international curatorial and institutional relationships for which there was a framework, but also moving outwards from that in particular directions. The um, issue you mentioned about the Fox Hall in particular has to do with the local politics of this uh, debate about the pseudo-avant-garde versus the real avant-garde and a kind of a certain division within Polish alternative circles that it was uh, presumably difficult for an outsider to, um, to, to cross those two boundaries to at once make contact with one group and with another. But some people did manage this. So these are very interesting questions. Um, Clemente Padin, I think I, I have actually interviewed and, and had conversations with him and, um, and uh, he uh, it continues to be very charming and interesting and, um, and recalls very warmly his own 
uh, trips, uh, his own visit, um, I think in, 19, in the mid 80s um, to, uh, to Germany. Um, so yes, there's lots more to be done. Thanks very much. Any more questions? Last one, thank you. Thank you, and uh, I try to be very short, and uh, however, to resume all the, the achievement you three or four uh, made. Concerning Ukraine, I, I, I take it from, uh, from the point of view of Hungarian artists, and I start from the beginning of the century, 19th, uh, 20th century, and start with Odessa and Eisenstein and Nietzsche Wolke and people like that but in this, this time was still Russia and uh, with the changes we realized at the end uh, 20, uh, 20 30 years before that Ukraine has an existing unit and then go back to Ma uh, and, and I take the relation of Lajos Kasak you mentioned with the review Ma, and it was another unit because a, a, a kind of globalization from Hungary and Vienna or the whole world. And then step by step we arrived at the participation of the occupation, I'm sorry, the liberation of Hungary in 45, the Ukraine troops. Uh, and Marshal Zhukov and people like that and, and the last colloquium in, in uh, Krakow, I think, or Warsaw, it was another proposal, it's a Nordic proposal, Baltic, uh, Czech, Czech land, Ukraine, uh, uh, to, the, to the Black uh, Sea, and I met Ukrainian art historians who told that my father was participating in 56 in Budapest and, and he didn't speak about anything. And uh, dot at the end. Then, uh, then uh, concerning uh, uh, Maya and Jordan, I think it's a, a fantastic uh, fantastic uh, achievement to start from uh, the interest of Eastern Europe, uh, starting immediately with e ecology and uh, supportable uh, uh, evolution of how to tell it, and to arrive e e again ecologically and, and repeat the whole story in the planetary system by the by the way, I mentioned that Vasarelli had a rather stupid idea of planetary folklore in the 60s, and, uh, and uh, I find it excellent that uh, they repeat uh, the, the Pleistocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Anthropocene, so historically is uh, also a uh, a kind of uh, kind of interest till today, and finally, uh, Clara. I think uh, uh, Clara made the made the most uh, most gigantic work, uh, collecting collecting new aspects and data and data and data and data, and. Uh, at the moment, I have to tell that she made a very good work with, with, her, with her first book, uh, presenting about eight or 15 artists. But now we see that uh, in Eastern European context, we have at least about 300 or 400 artists, and each has uh, works in Four, 400 pieces or till 2,000 pieces. No, and to establish the data bank, and we could we could start a real work, or it's absolutely unnecessary. 
I don't know, but everybody who made his, his, his uh, excellent works, I thank you so much. Still in the 70s, uh, carrying around and, and giving flash art, it was still newspaper format for free, you know. But, and also De Marco, this was really real enthusiasm, you could recognize it, and they really fought for what they do. I don't know about financial background of Glusberg, but concerning Yugoslav art, at least my bloody bastards from Bel Belgrade, they were not so much interested to cooperate with Glusberg because it was Latin America, at that time still province like us, they were much more interested to, to, to work with De Marco, which is also somehow, I mean, I criticize this position today. I don't know what we talked about in the 70s, but this was really a lot of work there. And this guy, I had it, I threw it away, you know, there was so much. And I have to ask about this Yugoslav edition because I, I don't remember it anymore. But it was really like doing something, you know, Eastern Europe, still Yugoslavia in the 70s, you know. Not, it was not on, on the route of many people, you know, mm -hmm. let alone uh, director of documenta, you know. So it was, it was really, there was a lot of energy, you know, involved in it. And just for, for Maya and, and uh, Ruben, uh, I somehow, now I don't know whether you include architecture in your research or not. Okay, it doesn't matter. But I believe what, what Piotr said, it's really fantastic route to, to research, to follow. But I see it maybe, maybe, I don't know whether I'm wrong or not. You know, what you do is in fact for me, implicit criticism of this, uh, of modernist theory and, and practice, you know, because uh, uh, if I think of architecture, you know, uh, all these buildings, post-war buildings, mainly also done because half of Europe was uh, destroyed, they didn't, there were not so much concerns for, for, for environment as far as I remember, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I see what you do somehow as a critique of this galloping modernism, you know, we all want it to be universal and modern in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, I also have a comment to my own trouble. Um, this is like, there is no environmental art in Eastern Europe, this is absolutely not true, and it's strongly opposed that. Uh, it is only covered. Um, it is covered under the, the the general definition of performance, because in the 60s and 70s the politici politicization of nature was a core element in performance art, and uh, it was very important and very special Eastern European way of dealing with nature and politicizing nature and globalizing nature and universalizing nature. So um, that's just really a comment to that. Thank you. I would have a short question concerning pan-futurism. And my question would be, to what an extent was the Russian constructivism important for pan-futurism? I'm asking this because in the journal that you have shown us, Nove Generatsi, there is a photograph, which looks very much like types of photographs that Rochenko did. Is this a coincidence or not? Uh, I would like to add actually a comment to uh, Boyana's uh, question to Maya and Ruben. Uh, I think uh, this is a radically anti-modernistic uh, uh, inquiry or point of view that uh, you uh, uh, present. Uh, I mean, not, maybe not in a totalistic <coughs> perspective, but actually it contradicts or it's critical towards one of the major dreams or paradigms of avant-garde and modern art, which is victory over the sun, the dream of subjugation of uh, nature, 
which you will find, for instance, uh, also in the writings of Malevich and also in his practice and many other uh, uh, artists, designers, architects. Uh, it's a completely different paradigm, I think, that you try to um, offer and I think it's very valuable. Uh, one question to, to Clara Kempoels. Uh, uh, concerning your research on uh, Grusberg again, uh, did you find some uh, traces of uh, his uh, contact uh, with, uh, with Warsaw and Jan Świdziński in, in his, his archive? Uh, because Grusberg participated in an uh, important uh, conference in, uh, in Warsaw in 77, so maybe, maybe uh, you found something about it uh, in your research. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, I would like to pause to Yana for a moment because uh, I'm. Uh, you, you. Uh, I didn't hear you, Maya Druva, mentioning the uh, like the Soviet more official kind of art, which in the 1960s and 70s um, very often turns to ecological issues. So that side was uh, for me untouched. Like uh, in graphic art, in painting, uh, the ecological issues are coming uh, pretty strongly in, especially in the 1970s. At least when I, when I look at the uh, Estonian material, where I am from. Okay, so maybe we can now uh, ask you to, to answer the questions and then we have a last round of questions. So. You Who wants to start? <laughs> Perhaps. Maya and Ruben, I think you would most uh, wanted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Michelle. Um, yeah, uh, where to start? Um, the start to start with crit critique of modernist art. Um, thinking about environment, it really calls for thinking, rethinking the whole environment and the whole and reason the and, yeah uh, I, and uh, and i would not just say modernism but equally postmodernism because we have we all know all the pitfalls of the of the, the postmodernism and what how much uh, the postmodernism was responsible for ignorance of the burning environmental issues and also thinking about the uh, the all the you know facts which we would uh, asked to be questioning rather than engaging with. And in that way, we kind of want to have the, uh, the distance come to both. And, uh, in the, and uh, to think about, uh, we, we have we come to this uh, 60s, 70s as an as important period. It is a very important period. It's important for the planetary thinking. And it's especially, it's obvious if we think that this is the period when people first time saw the planet from the space. This was the first visualization of, of our planet uh, that we had the images of. It was the beginning of the space the travel and also uh, of the whole, and that there are so many artworks with planet in it that uh, it would be ludicrous to think that uh, there is no environmental art. Of course there is. The Poem Stars is a very good example. The whole conceptual art contains so many elements of environmental art in it. It's just a question of uh, how we deal with it. And uh, whether it's uh, whether it's moral or whether it's uh, whether it's uh, whether the artists have a dominant um, attitude to it or or uh, the official question. So also, there's a very interesting question about um, uh, the position towards uh, uh, the environment in uh, official art, and, um, and we, we tried a little bit to talk about. The, the way you could read socialist realism also in terms of uh, uh, environmental history and um, uh, you, could, you, could, you could continue the, the argument also going into the 60s and, and 70s and the, what's specific also in the, in the Soviet case and the East European case with the uh, uh, with, without really including with Yugoslavia being slightly different What's specific about the Soviet and the East European case in the 70s and also maybe early 80s? 
in terms of the uh, official position is that they, um, uh, as, we, as we mentioned, you know, uh, pollution and environmental problems were very much seen as a, as a, as a Western uh, capitalist uh, problem. So in a way they could celebrate um, uh, uh, ecology as, as, a, as, a, as an achievement, as a Soviet achievement at the, uh, uh, at the same time. But it was very much on the surface, it was very much on the level of, uh, of uh, uh, propaganda. Um, and uh, also when you, when you see nature, maybe, maybe it's not so much about thinking about ecological uh, art, or environmental art, in official art, but uh, what's interesting is, is also looking at how this, this story of uh, the attempt to master nature, which took a particularly extreme form under Stalinism, but actually continues uh, uh, in the 70s in, in Eastern Europe, maybe in a, in, a, in a way more than it does in the West, where, you, where, where environmental and or places which took part in the Stockholm uh, summit of 72, and where, where ecology got a more kind of public uh, uh, face and got, was, was more widespread. So in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union, the this, this same myth was, was pushed even further in the 70s. You can look at that also in terms of environmental history, in terms of the uh, huge uh, projects in the Soviet Union to, uh, uh, you know, to ex extend these uh, uh, railways into the Arctic North, and the terrible exploitation of the Arctic North that happened there. And in the official art of the time, you have celebrations of that. So there's a lot of art, uh, of paintings of, of these uh, 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 of, of these uh, uh, kind of brave, brave explorers and so on, conquering the north and conquering nature by building uh, train lines and roads through this pristine uh, wilderness uh, in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the Russian north, the Soviet north uh, as well, the Arctic uh, area. And, uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I'm not sure that um, uh, uh, Boyana Obeke really had asked questions in particular, but um, thank you to both of them. And um, uh, I'd like to do an interview with Boyana, of course, about this body-to-body -body contact with the big pioneering men, because that would be funny. Um, but I think, you know, a couple of them I, I did meet and, um, and that, yeah, of course it is a very physical kind of an enthusiasm and I think that that's, that's really interesting and that's something that um, is difficult to convey um, in words. But actually, you know, through interviews and through the, so the good selection of the right kinds of photographs and documents, I really hope that somehow I can bring this alive, to, you know, to some extent and that in a way is a part of the, the purpose of this book, which I'm doing for many years now, and it's really an attempt to produce precisely this kind of a scrapbook archive, like a collective, um, it's in no way a definitive, but it's to try to offer a selection of these really personal sorts of memories and encounters. Um, so um, in terms of the question about uh, Glusberg, uh, for the Yugoslav artists, I have a list of the people who participated, but none of them were very memorable to me. They were not the, the, that kind of performance generation that I was more interested in. Um, <coughs> I haven't done specific research about Gorsberg very much. He's peripheral, really, to my concerns. The Latin America and Eastern Europe thing is the topic of my teaching rather than the topic of, the topic of my book. Um, I'm focusing mostly on East-East relations, but also on the um, external agents that made East-East connections possible. Um, so the book doesn't have um, a, a large section about Glusberg. Um, and I haven't consulted the Glusberg archive because um, to my knowledge and through my efforts, and I did spend a couple of weeks making efforts and various telephone calls, and it was while he was still alive, uh, that there was no possibility to consult an archive, and I'm skeptical that such a thing exists. Um, and haven't yet met anybody else who has consulted such a thing. But as I said, there is, um, you know, there are scatterings of, of materials. But I haven't seen his, you know, the, his per I've seen his personal letters. For example, the letter that I showed from Glusberg to Zanini, and so on. But it's a huge job, which is for a monograph for somebody else to do. To so, um, in terms of the. Uh, his contact particularly with Shijinsky, uh, I don't know, I haven't looked in the Shijinsky archive either yet, but it's ongoing. Thank you for telling me. Mr. Marina, please. 
Last word. Thank you for your comment. Uh, it was it was not a question, but uh, Russian uh, Odessa and the Ukrainian Budapest that shows how controversial uh, this this discourse is and how the, this friendship between the peoples uh, worked in in the socialist. Uh, the question about the constructivism. Uh, the uh, the pan futurists uh, were very critical toward uh, Russian constructivism and uh, the, the criticizes often in the in the Nova uh, Generatia. Uh, but uh, it was the last uh, the last uh, among that uh, journal uh, which existed in the Soviet Union until thirty. The the, the other were already closed uh, and also left. And Novi Lev, the new Lev, uh, the left front of, uh, of art. Uh, and uh, so they gave, uh, I think what I showed, it was for 29, uh, they, they gave a platform for them, for, for, for the Lev uh, artist, uh, and uh, for, for Rochinka. And uh, but their um, uh, so favorite uh, was Mohan Lodge, and uh, they published uh, a lot of him and phot photographs uh, and uh, uh, and and his uh, his uh, text. But it was a subversive uh, action of support uh, of. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. So we have two more minutes for the last round of questions. Okay, I think the one reminder. Okay. Yeah, uh, to, thank you very much. Tomorrow we are meeting as usual at 10 o'clock, but let me remind you that in between the time will be changed. So we can sleep one, one hour more. So um, uh, tomorrow 10 o'clock will be something like uh, today 11 o'clock. I don't know what is the night entertainment. This is the last word we'll be to uh, public uh, uh, the but please keep in mind that uh, uh, the, the time will be changed for now. Thank you.